Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we are entering into the Sabbath hours, we once again invite your presence. We ask that you give us discernment to keep our thoughts and our actions, our words, lifted up throughout this blessed time. We ask that you would teach us things that would waken our hearts, waken our minds to the times in which we're living, and give us the information, the ability we need that we can walk with you as Enoch walked, that we might be among the 144,000 that participate in finishing this work. We thank you once again for the traveling mercies that you extended to all of us and ask for your continued presence throughout this weekend. We ask that the words spoken here would be truthful and honest and for your honor, your glory, easily understood, and that you would open our hearts and mind to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know um, how many of you are on our mailing list, but we send out, a, send out a newsletter, we try to get it out once a month, and the April newsletter has been mailed, and I don't know how many of you received it. Um, how many of you aren't on our mailing list? Can you raise your hands? Okay, there. We brought some of those April newsletters, and the reason that I'm referring to it is I'm, in, I'm going to use about nine quotes here in this presentation that are in that newsletter. And the newsletter um, will also give a little bit of a repetition of what I'm going to try to share here. But some of these quotes are kind of obscure in Adventism. I mean, they're not <coughs> familiar. And uh, I don't know when we'll break that out. Probably tomorrow. I trust you'll all be back here tomorrow. But the, the title of this presentation is The Foundations. Now, I, I know that I dealt with the seven thunders, and I'm kind of just leaving that hanging in midair. I'll get back to the seven thunders, Lord willing. Um, tomorrow, we're going to talk about how every ref reformatory movement parallels every other reformatory movement. And when you see this, you'll realize that the fact that the Millerite history is a reformatory movement is, a, is an argument that the reformatory movement of the 144,000 is a repetition of the Millerite history to the very letter. It's another argument in connection to what we were dealing with in our last presentation. So we have more to say about that. But we want to add into all this a thought about the foundations and the, and the role of the foundations in Adventism. Um, so turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 10. 11. It says, Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. And the way that I understand that passage is that the entire Bible is given testimony to the things that take place at the end of the world, it's given examples of what takes place at the end of the world. In Romans 15, um, verse 4, you have a, a similar thought along that line. It says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. What was written aforetime is for us, here at the end of the world. 1 Corinthians 14.32 says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. And this verse no doubt means many things, but one of the things that it means is that none of the prophets are going to disagree with each other. All the prophets are giving the same testimony, and they're all giving a testimony about what takes place at the end of the world. If they, if they weren't, if John was telling us what was going to take place at the end of the world and Daniel was telling us something different, there would be confusion. And the next verse, verse 33, 
after it says, and the spirits of the prophets are subject, un, subject to the prophets, verse 33 says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all, the, all churches of the saints. So all the prophets are in agreement with each other. They're telling the same story. Um, 1 Peter 1.12, another thought along this same line. Um, <clears throat> Let's start in verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who have prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did test signify when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed, not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. The prophetic testimony is the, the examples, the illustrations, the parallels of what takes place at the end of the world. And if you go to Daniel 12, verse, let's start in verse 3. In verse 3 of Daniel 12, it says, And they that be wise, and if you have a marginal reference for the word wise, it's teachers. I would submit to you that Daniel is the same as all the other prophets. He's speaking about the end of the world. And yes, this had a fulfillment in the Millerite history, but it's going to have a fulfillment at the end of the world. And it says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run true and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. The wise in this passage are contrasted <clears throat> with the wicked. If you go down to verse 9, it says, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked should do, shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. The wise are those that understand the increase of knowledge, and they are the teachers. They are those that present the message that lead many to righteousness, and those that they lead to righteousness through the message are going to shine as stars forever and ever. And this is a testimony about the end of the world. And Hosea is giving a testimony about the end of the world. And in Hosea 4.6, it says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten thy law. I will also forget thy children. Um, the increase of knowledge that took place in the Millerite history and the increase of knowledge that will take place at the end of the world is life or death. And the increase of knowledge will produce a purification <coughs> process among God's people that develops 144,000. As an example of that, if you have enough information already from your own studies that teach you that the Millerite history is repeated at the end of the world, just to give you an example of this purification process, William Miller proclaimed the first angel's message. Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. And in Revelation 14, the first angel's message is called the everlasting gospel. And the first time the, first time the gospel is mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis 3.15. And in Genesis 3.15, based upon the principle of first occurrence, the principle of first occurrence in the Bible is that whenever a subject occurs for the first time, the entire subject is is established right there and then. And the everlasting gospel is first identified in verse 15 of, Revelation, of Genesis 3, and it says, 
and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And this is a pronouncement against Satan, saying that the Lord is going to put a hatred between two seeds, the seed of Satan and the seed of Christ. And one of the truths of the gospel is this is the work of the gospel. It produces, as Sister White says, two classes of worshipers. The gospel produces two classes of worshipers. And here in Genesis 3.15, this is being identified as part of the work of the gospel. And the Millerites, when they proclaimed the first angel's message, and that's who they were, they were the messengers of the first angel, they were proclaiming the everlasting gospel. And you can see that they not only proclaimed the everlasting gospel, but they experienced it. Because though they began proclaiming the everlasting gospel here, 1833, and it was empowered in 1840, when you get to October 22nd, 1844, the historians tell us that there was roughly 50,000 Millerites, but on October 23rd, only 50 moved into the most holy place with Christ. There was two classes of, classes of worshipers that had been developed during that time period, and in early writings, page 259 and other places, Sister White tells us that the 49,950 foolish virgins of that time period that continued to direct their prayers to the holy place, who began to answer their prayers? Satan. They had become the seed of Satan. The gospel produces two classes of worshipers. And this history is to be repeated in the development of the 144,000 and within Adventism, the Lord is going to raise up the people that are the 144,000, and the majority of God's people are going to receive the mark of the beast, while those people that I'm calling the 144,000 receive the seal of God during this purification process. And according to Daniel 12, and according to the history of the Millerites, what produces this testing process is an increase of knowledge that comes from God's prophetic word at the end of time. So when Hosea says, my people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge, it puts the significance of what the seven thunders is in a different light, because what we're suggesting is that the seven thunders is the prophetic light that is unsealed for God's people at the end of the world. It is the increase of knowledge that is going to test God's people and ultimately contribute to the production of these two classes of worshipers. And to be on the wrong side of the subject is death. All the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. If you go to Isaiah 58, and I'm waiting for someone to correct me on this, and I, I've said this to you know, lay people and pastors. We were with a group of pastors here not too long ago in Germany, and I, I, I have heard what I'm going to tell you many times in Adventism, but I don't know if it's true. I'm not threatened if it is or is not true. I, I would like to have confirmation. I've heard this from what I'm going to tell you from many sources, but it could be incorrect, that the chapter in the Bible that Sister White refers to more than any other is Isaiah 58. Um, I know that she refers to it all many, many times. I'm satisfied with that, so I don't think that it means a great deal if, if I'm a little bit off. But Isaiah 58 is about you and I at the end of the world. It's about God's people at the end of the world. And one of the characteristics of God's people at the end of the world is found in verse 12 of Isaiah 58. It says, And they that shall be of thee shall build up the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorers, restorer of paths to dwell in. Now, <clears throat> Such a white in, the, in Review and Herald, October 13, 1891, one of the places where she comments on this verse, she says, Here are given the characteristics of those who shall be reformers, who will bear the banner of the third angel's message, those who avow themselves God's commandment-keeping people and who honor God and are earnestly engaged in sight of all the universe in building up the old waste places. Who is it that calls them? The repairers of the breach? The restorers of the past to dwell in? It is God. Their names are registered in heaven as reformers, restorers, and raising up the foundations of many generations. Brothers and sisters, 
the 144,000, one of the works they're going to do is raise up the foundations of many generations, and tomorrow we will show you how the foundations in the plural of many generations are raised up. In black and white, crystal clear. And it's important to see this. And, but, and the, the way we're going to attempt to do it for you is that Sister White tells us in the Great Controversy is that every reform movement is the same. They parallel all the other. And as you go through the different reform movements, you'll see that they each have a foundational message in each of those histories. And the foundational message is always established at a certain point in time. And you have to go through, you have to go through and look at where these foundations in these reform movements are established because you're living at the end of the world and you need to be one of those people that understand what the foundations are. But God's people at the end of the world that raise up the foundations of many generations, they're going to be the restorers of the paths to dwell in. And what are the paths to dwell in? Jeremiah 6.16 tells us what the paths to dwell in are. <clears throat> Jeremiah 6.16 says, Thus saith the Lord. Now remember, Jeremiah is speaking about the end of the world just like all the other prophets. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. So at the end of the world, God's people are going to have to go back to the old paths. And when they go back to the old paths, there's going to be a controversy because there's going to be some people among God's people that says, we're not going to walk in the old paths. We don't want anything to do with the old paths. Notice verse 17. And I will set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. Look at Jeremiah 18, 15. And remember, Jeremiah is speaking about the end of the world. Verse 15 says, because my people hath forgotten me, they have burned incense to vanity, and they have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths, to walk and pass in a way not cast up, to make their land desolate and a perpetual hiss hissing. Everyone that passes thereby shall be astonished and wag his head. I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. I will show shew them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. Then said they, come and let us devise devices against Jeremiah, for the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us smite him with the tongue, and let us give heed, not give heed to any of his words. Notice that here is God's people at the end of the world, brothers and sisters. That's what the prophets are speaking about. That refuse to walk in the ancient paths, and those people that are counseling them to walk in the ancient paths are going to suffer the wrath of those people that don't want to walk in the ancient paths. That's what it's, what it's saying there. Now, <clears throat> what I'm suggesting here is that the, the foundations of Adventism are the truths that are represented on these two charts. And you can go through, you look at the, you look at the newsletter that I re referenced, whether you get it in the mail in the near future or you get one from us tomorrow, and you realize that virtually all the major truths on this chart have been rejected by the Seventh-day Adventist Church leadership. But I, I'm not pointing any fingers at the Seventh-day Adventist Church leadership because from my understanding, most of the lay people in Adventism don't understand these truths either. This isn't... This isn't a condemnation. This is just identifying a fact of where we are in prophecy at the end of the world that the foundational truths of Adventism have been sealed up. And how do you suppose they've been sealed up? Through the reception of traditions and customs that have been handed down from generation to generation. And it's not so much, it's not so important to identify that the leadership of the Adventist church has rejected the foundations or that the lay people have rejected the foundations because they don't know them. It, but it needs to be identified so that you and I can stimulate our sanctified curiosity and go back 
and see what the foundations were so we can participate in reestablishing and restoring those foundations. So why am I saying that that's the foundation? Uh, by the way, this is a... <laughs> sometimes when you're, when you're sharing this particular message, you're, you're sharing it with people that haven't heard any of this information before, okay? And, and there's a couple trick questions you can use to make a point. But this particular audience, I know I can't use this trick question to make a point. So, I'm going to try to qualify this question. Those of you that have studied the 2520 do not answer this question, all right? How many of you have studied the 2520? Okay, you, you can't answer this question. For those of you that haven't studied the 2520, how many of you that haven't studied are prepared to give a Bible study to a non-Adventist tomorrow on the 2520 time prophecy of Leviticus 26? Please raise your hand. Now, I've literally asked that question to hundreds, I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of Seventh-day Adventists, and nobody's hands go up. It doesn't matter right now that whether you understand the 2520 time prophecy or not, all that matters to me at this point is that you see on this chart here, which is the 1843 Pioneer chart, you see up here in the right-hand corner a time prophecy identified, the 2520 time prophecy. And I'm suggesting to you here that that time prophecy is one of the foundational truths of Adventism, and God's people no longer know what it is. And I'm only making this point to try to demonstrate that when Sister White says the seven thunders represent the history of 1840 to 1844, and that Revelation 10, verse 4 says the seven thunders were sealed up, that it's been sealed up. God's people don't understand the foundational truths of Adventism any longer. Let me read you some quotes. Review and Herald, January 19, 1905, and these are the ones that I said were in the newsletter. Does that have to be there, Glenn? That microphone? Is there a purpose for that being there? No. Okay. Um, here's the quote from Review and Herald, January 19, 1905. God is not giving us a new message. We are to proclaim the message that in 1843 and 1844 brought us out of the other churches. We have the same message that was proclaimed in 1843 and 1844. And what was that message? Let me ask it this way. How many Millerite preachers were there in the Millerite? 300. Of those 300 Millerite preachers, how many of them used this chart? 100%. Did they teach anything else? Nope. This was the message that in 1843 and 1844 brought us out of the churches. We have no new message, she says. Manuscript release number 760 says, God bids us, to, bids us give our time and strength to the work of preaching to the people the messages that stirred the people in 1843 and 1844. And one of the messages that stirred the people was the 2520. And I'm not trying to emphasize the 2520 over and above anything else. It's just an easy point to show that this history has been sealed up. One of the, the messages that stirred the people in that time period was the 2520. What was the first time prophecy that William Miller discovered? 2520. What does he say of this time prophecy? It's this time prophecy that led him to understand and discover the 2300 time prophecy. So when it comes to the 2300 year prophecy, which we understand to be the foundation of Adventism, if we're going to understand the foundation of Adventism in terms of Daniel 8.14, then we need to understand that the, the truth that led William Miller there was right there, the 2520. By the way, we know there was an error on this chart, right? Sister White says the Lord held his hand over some of the figures on the chart until his hand was removed. We're going to read that quote in a minute from early writing 74. But in, in 1849, Sister White was given a vision where she was told to tell her husband to print a new chart to correct the errors on this chart. And so in 1850, the Nichols chart was produced. That's this chart. And in the first three Review and Heralds, you can see this chart advertised. I think it was for 20 cents. It's 10 or 20 cents for this chart. And so this chart, the reason that this chart was produced 
was to correct the year zero on this chart, all right? And the only difference with this chart and this chart is now they're understanding the sanctuary. They don't have the sanctuary on this chart because in 1843 they thought the sanctuary was the earth, right? And it'd be destroyed by fire. So they got the sanctuary over here. But in terms of the 2520, it's right down here. You can look at it and on your, they, didn't, they didn't do away with the 2520. It's still on that chart. We'll read a quote about that chart in a moment. We've read two quotes about the messages of 1843 and 1844. Here's the third. Manuscript Releases, Volume 15, page 371. The truths that we received in 1841, 1842, 1843, and 1844 are now to be studied and proclaimed. The message of the first, second, and third angel will in the future be proclaimed with a loud voice. There will be given, they will be given with earnest determination and in the power of the Spirit. Now, there's a very important point here. This is the third quote that we've read endorsing the messages of 1840 to 1844. But in this one, when she quotes the truths that they received in 1841, 42, 43, and 44, somehow, some way, she says those truths have a connection with the loud cry. And what's the loud cry? In the terminology of Ellen White, what's the loud cry? It's the loud cry of the third angel that takes place when the fourth angel of Revelation 18 joins it. It's what we call the latter rain message. So the message of the latter rain, according to Sister White, has some kind of connection with the truths that they were led to understand in that history that's represented on that chart. Here's another quote. And this, is, this is one of the most important in my mind. This is Review and Herald, April 14, 1903. The warning has come. Nothing is to be allowed to come in that will disturb the foundation of the faith upon which we've been building ever since the message came in 1842, 1843, 1844. The foundation of Adventism was raised up before October 22nd, 1844. Seventh-day Adventists, by and large, even conservative historic, if you, if you like that term, I don't know that that's correct. We don't understand that. We think the foundations of Adventism are the sanctuary, the Sabbath, the, the second coming, the spirit of prophecy, and the state of the dead. I don't have a problem saying that those are pillars that are directly connected to the foundations, but did they understand uh, the sanctuary correctly in 1841, 1842, 1843, 1844? Did they understand the spirit of prophecy? Did they understand the second coming? Sort of, but they were, they were wrong about when it was going to take place. Did they understand the state of the dead? Barely. It was coming in during that time period. But the point is, the foundations, according to her, the warning has come, according to Sister White, nothing is to be allowed to come in that will disturb the foundation of the faith upon which we've been building ever since the message came in 1842, 1843, and 1844. She goes on. She's going to say something else that's, that's important here I, um, that I'm taking note of, probably lots that I'm not recognizing that's important here. I was in this message, and ever since I've been standing before the world, true to the light that God has given us, we do not propose to take our feet off the platform on which they were placed as day by day we sought the Lord with earnest prayer seeking for light. She's saying that the foundation and platform of Adventism was established in 1842, 1843, and 1844. Now this is important because in early writings, page 259, and we're going to read this quote before we get out of here this weekend, Lord willing, is the passage in the chapter titled A Firm Platform where she says she saw three steps and she, she's seen men on a foundation and a platform, and some people stepped off the pa platform and foundation and began to examine it and have problems with it. You remember that vision? She uses the term foundation and platform there in early writings, page 259, just as she's using here. And she's saying the truce of 1842 and 1843 and 1844 are the foundation and platform of Adventism. And if you had to represent 
the truths of 1842 and 1843 and 1844, there's only one thing you can do it with. I mean, you can make up your own, but this is it. This represents the foundational truths of Adventism, according to those four quotes. Here's another one from Manuscript Releases, Volume 21, page 437. This is another place where she's going to emphasize a connection between that message and the loud cry message. All the messages given from 1840 to 1844 are to be made forcible now, for there are many people who have lost their bearings. The messages are to go to all the churches. Christ said, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Blessed are the eyes which saw the things that were seen in 1843 and 1844. The message was given, and there was, then there should be no delay in repeating the message. For the signs of the times are fulfilling, the closing work must be done, a great work will be done in a short time, a message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. Then Daniel shall stand in his lot to give his testimony. She's once again drawing a connection between the messages of 1840 to 1844 and the loud cry message, which is in agreement with Isaiah 58, 12, because the 144,000 that are going to accomplish the work of Isaiah 58, 12, that restore the old paths, they're also going to be the people that proclaim the loud cry message under the power of the latter reign. It's by going back to the foundational message that they're going to get their point of reference to understand the final warning message. That's what's being taught here with this. That's five quotes where Sister White endorses the messages of that history. Here's another. Those who stand as teachers and leaders, and, and how many of us in this room are teachers? If you believe Daniel 12, verse 3, everyone at the end of the world is going to be a teacher. Those who stand as teachers and leaders in our institutions are to, sound, to be sound in the faith and principles of the third angel's message. God wants his people to know that we have the message as he gave it to us in 1843 and 1844. That's the message that is the foundation and platform of Adventism. Usually, we're familiar with the quote in early writings, page 74, speaking of this chart. She says, I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered, that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none could see it until his hand was removed. God was involved with the production of this chart. In fact, the pioneers correctly understood that this was brought about through a passage from Habakkuk and Ezekiel. They were directed to make this chart. Now, concerning this chart, the 1850 chart, which upholds these same truths, you know, you'll find in this, in this newsletter that we're speaking about, you'll find an email from the Biblical Research Department of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's a fair, fairly recent email, either the very end of last year or the beginning of this year, where they're, they're suggesting that we no longer accept the 2520, but they also point out that we no longer accept the trumpets as the pioneers understand them. And I, I want you to see that here is the fifth trumpet represented on this chart, and here is the sixth trumpet represented on this chart. And on this chart, you have the fifth trumpet right here, and you have the sixth trumpet right here, Sister White says that this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered, but in 1850, they made a chart to correct the mistakes on this chart. And here's what she says about this chart. I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brother Nichols. God was in the publishment of this chart. I saw that there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. And if this chart is designed for God's people, 
If it's sufficient for one, it is for another. Brothers and sisters, the foundational truths of Adventism are represented on those charts. And God isn't giving us a new message and part of the work of the 144,000 is to return to the old paths, to restore the ancient paths. When that work begins to take place, do you think that all of Adventism is going to stand up and say, praise the Lord, let's all go back to the old paths? No way. That's what we've been warned. They would not walk therein. There's going to be a controversy over this issue. Now, if you were counting, that's seven, eight, maybe I better count, seven or eight direct endorsements of the message of that time period. And uh, let me read you one more, if I can turn right to it. And you're all familiar with this one. This is from Great Controversy, page 334-335. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition on, of Revelation 9, predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. He's publishing a prediction based upon the time prophecy in the sixth trumpet. And some of us here at the end of the world who are no longer familiar with this history, and the reason we're no longer familiar with this history is because this history is represented by the seven thunders, and the seven thunders were sealed up. So we've received customs and traditions that have been handed down through generation to generation. We're no longer familiar with this history. So we read what she says here about Josiah Litch's work in publishing a tract concerning the time prophecy of the sixth trumpet, and we think Josiah Litch was the only Millerite that understood this. Brothers and sisters, every Millerite taught this. Every Millerite taught this. This was the chart that they were using, and I'm not just pulling this out of the hair, you, out of my head. You go look at the Adventist historians. Miller had three or four sermons on these trumpets here. They all taught this. It's just that Josiah Litch was used by the Lord to put it into a tract. That's all this is saying in, in Great Controversy. Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published an exposition of Revelation 9 predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown, and I drop some out here, on the 11th of August, 1840, when the Ottoman power in Constantinople may be expected to be broken. And this, I believe, will be found to be the case. At the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. Men of learning and position united with Miller, both in preaching and in publishing his views, and from 1840 to 1844, the work rapidly extended. Okay, and if you would now, <clears throat> I think that's nine. Let's count them just to be sure. One, two, three, four, five, Six quotes I read you about the messages of 1843, 1844. Two endorsements of the chart that have those messages represented on them, which makes eight. And then the endorsement of their understanding that is represented on this chart. You can see it here represented. Broke down. This is the time prophecy. Nine places where Sister White specifically endorses the messages that are represented on these charts, and in doing so, she calls them the foundation and the platform of Adventism, and she identifies that they were understood before 1844, and one of the works of the 144,000 is they have to raise up the foundations of many generations and restore the past to dwell in, which are the ancient paths that have been sealed up.
through the reception of customs and traditions that have been handed down from generation to generation. And the fact that we're talking about this tonight tells you that the Lord is in the process right now of unsealing the seven thunders and therefore probation is about to close. There's, there's just too much evidence piling up on this. So, um, Let's go get a little bit ahead of schedule for tomorrow. Go with me, if you would, to Isaiah 28. <clears throat> All the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. In verse 1 of Isaiah 28, it says, woe to the crown of pride. What's a crown represent? <clears throat> King, leadership. This is, this is a pronouncement against uh, the leadership of the drunkards of Ephraim. It says, woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. He's going to talk about these drunkards of Ephraim um, being drunk with wine, but it's important to know who the drunkards of Ephraim are, and all you have to do is drop down to verse 14. It becomes very clear. If you remember that in Testimonies, volume 5, page 211, Sister White identifies Jerusalem as the Seventh-day Adventist church. You don't need that passage, but that's an easy one. Volume 5, page 211, Seventh-day Adventist church is Jerusalem at the end of the world. Then in verse 14 of Isaiah 28, because Sister White's a prophet, Isaiah is the prophet, and the spirits of the prophets are subject of, unto the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion. So they're telling the same story, and in verse 14 it says, Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. The drunkards of Ephraim are the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist church at the end of the world. And I know that when certain people hear me say that, they think I'm worried about attacking the Seventh-day Adventist church, and I'm not. All I'm doing is identify the circumstances which God's people find themselves at the end of the world during the time period when the 144,000 are raised up, and it's the same circumstances that have existed in every reformatory movement. When the Lord brings the message of the hour to light, those people that should have been the ones that understood the message, proclaimed the message, and pushed the message, invariably fight against it. There's nothing new under the sun, according to Solomon. I don't know how to tell that without people twisting it to say that I'm attacking the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but I do understand enough that it needs to be said, even if it gets twisted. At the end of the world, those people that are the leaders in Jerusalem are the scornful men that, according to this passage, are drunk. It tells us what they're drunk with. If you go to chapter 29, verse, nine, verse 1, it says, Woe to Ariel, to Ariel the city where David dwelt. Ariel is just another name for Jerusalem. You know, when I lived in Southern California, they used to call Los Angeles the city of the smog. It has a different, more than one name. Ariel is Jerusalem. So chapter 29, it's still dealing with Jerusalem, the city where David dwelt. And in verse 9, it says, Stay yourself and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and have closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers and the seers he hath covered. Their drunkenness is that they don't see. They don't see. What don't they see? The next verse tells us, and the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. What book is sealed? The book of Daniel. They're given the book of Daniel at the end of the world because that's when the prophets are speaking about. And they don't understand the book of Daniel because they're drunk. They're drunk in the sense that they don't have the spiritual discernment any longer to understand what the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation means. You want to know why? Because they've discarded the foundations of Adventism, and that's the point of reference to understand Daniel and Revelation correctly. But let's continue on. Verse 11 says, And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver that one is learned, saying, 
Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. Now, the book of Daniel, the sealed book, is given to one that is learned in Adventism. And what, who's one that is learned in Adventism? The educated. And they say, I can't understand the book of Daniel and Revelation any longer because it's sealed up. But you and I, as lay people, we don't get off the hook because the next verse says this. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned. That's you and I, right? Saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I'm not learned. The lay people in Adventism, they refuse to understand the books of Daniel and Revelation, except that it be taught to them by someone that is learned. But someone that is learned cannot teach it to them because it's sealed up to them. So at the end of the world, the Seventh-day Adventist church no longer understands the books of Daniel and Revelation. A drunkenness, a blindness, a sleep has come upon them. Verse 16 tells why. We, we won't spend time on verse 16, but we'll put it in a point of reference. And you should read all of this in context, verse by verse. I'm going very quickly here. Verse 16 says, Sur Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he hath no understanding? Brothers and sisters, there is something that gets turned upside down that destroys the ability to understand the books of Daniel and Revelation. Now, there's some of us, and this is, this is probably borderline fanaticism here. I'm, I'm warning you. There's some of us that when we read early writings, page 74, and it says the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord, there's some of us that when we look at that, we say, yeah, all the truths on there were directed by the hand of the Lord. But you know what? The fact that the cross is the very center of it, we think maybe he put the cross right in the center of this chart, too. He was directing, perhaps, even the, the layout of the chart. You don't have to buy that. It's not important. But right there, also in the center, is the year 508. 508 is identifying the year that the daily was taken away. And it don't matter what you, right now what you understand about the daily. I just want to tell you this. The pioneers of Adventism understood that the daily in the book of Daniel represented a satanic power, paganism. Amen. Today in Adventism, we teach that the daily in the book of Daniel represents Christ's sanctuary ministry, a godly power. We've taken a foundational understanding and turned it upside down. It's not a minor disagreement. It's a complete reversal, and I believe the reason that we can't understand the book of Daniel any longer, is when you take the daily and you turn it from a satanic power into a godly power, you destroy your ability to identify the work of the United States in Bible prophecy. Because Jesus is the God that illustrates the end of something with the beginning of something. And the first time the papacy was placed upon the throne of the earth, it was placed upon the throne of the earth by pagan Rome. The United States places the papacy on the throne of the earth at the end of the world. Therefore, and for a lot of prophetic truths that can support this, pagan Rome is paralleling the work of the United States. And the strongest illustration of pagan Rome in the book of Daniel is the daily. And if you destroy your ability to identify the daily as paganism, you've removed some of the most important aspects of the work of pagan Rome placing the papacy on the throne of the earth, and suddenly you're not too real sure about what the United States is doing on planet earth today. And brothers and sisters, our work is not the first angel's message as the Millerites. Ours is the third angel's message, which is to give a warning about the mark of the beast, and that includes the truth that it is the United States that forces the world to accept the mark of the beast. And we must be clear upon what the daily represents but it's been turned upside down. In the midst of this pronouncement in Isaiah 28 and 29, there is a question raised in verse 9. It says, whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he teach knowledge? Knowledge at the end of the world. What is knowledge at the end of the world? Daniel 12, 4. There's going to be an increase of knowledge at the end of the world. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. So this is raising an important question. 
at the time period when there's a pronouncement going against the Seventh-day Adventist Church for getting itself in a place where it no longer understands the prophetic message which it was raised up to proclaim, there's a question raised, whom shall teach knowledge? Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. What does that mean? It means those people that understand the increase of knowledge, brothers and sisters, they're not going to be people that are babes in Christ. Hebrews 5. You keep your, your finger in, in Isaiah 28 and go to Hebrews 5. Verse 12. Now all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. If you believe that, say amen. <laughs> okay? So, so Hebrews is talking about the end of the world too, right? And it says in verse 12, for when, for when for the time you ought to be teachers. Who's the teachers at the end of the world? It's the wise that understand the increase of knowledge in Daniel 12, 3 and 4. When you get to the end of the world, when it's time for the Lord to raise up the wise that are going to lead many to righteousness, at that time, it says, you have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracle of God. In other words, when the time comes for the Lord to raise up the 144,000, his people are going to be in the Laodicean condition. They're going to be, they're going to be, the truth's going to be sealed up to them. They're going to be in the position where Christ is knocking for entrance and they don't think they really need him inside. Okay, The time you ought to be teachers, you need to start at the very basics and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Verse 13, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism, of the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. There's nothing wrong with these doctrines, but this is the milk of God's word. And the 144,000 are going to be people that are no longer feeding upon the milk of God's word. Amen. If you go back to Isaiah 28, verse 9, it says, Whom shall you teach knowledge? Whom shall you, he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, but that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. <clears throat> Several things in this passage. This is teaching about God's people at the end of the world. It's saying that the condition, from my understanding, that these chapters in context are saying that the scornful men that lead Jerusalem and the lay people that follow them no longer understand the book that's sealed because something's been turned upside down. But in the midst of this, it's talking about a, a people that will understand the increase of knowledge. And it's also promising that even in this condition that the Lord is going to speak to this people. Verse 11 says, For with stammering lips and another tongue, he's saying that even though the watchmen, those that were ordained to be the watchmen, do not do their work, the Lord is going to raise up watchmen to finish the work. And that's a, a clear teaching in the spirit of prophecy, is run the word watchman. But it's identifying when this takes place. It says, For this is the refreshing but they would not hear. Whatever the refreshing is, there is an argument about it that will not be heard. And uh, if I can turn right to it, I'm not sure that I can. Um, the refreshing is very clear. 
in the spirit of prophecy. It's clear in the Bible. But the refreshing is the latter rain. Um, let me see if I can turn to a couple quotes here on this subject. I'll bring them, I'll bring them tomorrow. The refreshing, Sister White's clear, is the latter rain time period. In the latter rain time period, there is going to be a, an increase of knowledge, a message that is brought to God's people. It's going to be a message that is going to be resisted because when the message is, is proclaimed, there's going to be people that refuse to hear it. And it's going to be a testing message because at the, the last half of verse 13, it says, this line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. There's going to be a controversy over the message that's proclaimed during the latter rain time period by this stammering tongue, by this increase of knowledge. And the important point that I want to leave us here with tonight, if I can, is that whatever this message is, it's going to be illustrated to God's people by bringing line upon line, here a little, there a little. And tomorrow, we're going to begin bringing line upon line together the great reformatory movements, and in so doing, we believe we will be illustrating the latter rain message here at the end of the world and raising up the foundations of many generations and opening up the seven thunders according to God's will. I, that's a pretty, pretty profound claim. I know that, but I hope to, I hope to see, show you why I'm making that claim here, and I hope to challenge your, your sanctified um, curiosity to stimulate you to come back here tomorrow, because if what we're saying is true, it's something you need to know. Amen. If what we're saying is false, then you need to stand up and oppose it. But indifference at this point in Earth's history, when the world is filled with war and the economy is falling apart and the weather is totally out of control and the diseases are rampant, brothers and sisters, we're at the end of the world. We're at the end of the world. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we wish to be among those that participate in the final warning message, those that are empowered by the latter rain. And we know that only those that are daily receiving of the early rain will be partakers of the latter rain. So we ask that you would help us to be faithful in that work of accomplishing the early rain in our experience, which you've told us is perfecting holiness and the fear of the Lord. We ask that you would put a seriousness, a solemnness on our heart for the times in which we're living and the, the message that we're hearing that we would be challenged to test these things according to the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, and see if they're so. We want to be convicted of the, the truth or error of what we're sharing here. We want to be among those that, that share these things if they are true. Help this to happen in each of our lives. We know that we all have things that we need to put away, that we need to deal with. Give us the discernment to see those things and bring our houses into order. We ask for traveling mercies as we part now. We ask that you'd give us a good night's rest that we can be refreshed tomorrow. And we thank you for the Sabbath hours that we can consider these holy thoughts, these holy ideas. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son, for the work that you're doing for us now in the most holy place and help us um, always stay in that place with you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> what time do we start tomorrow? <clears throat>